3. Assignment 3, we are playing Connect 4 with the Minimax algorithm with alpha beta pruning. So, I am giving you this interface in which you can play Connect 4. So what is Connect 4? Connect 4 is a very simple game. Hopefully, you have played it before. But if you haven't, I will explain the rules for you. Connect 4 is played by two players. Um, you have a blue board, you know, that's the, you, this is played with a physical board. And what happens is with the physical board, you, you drop a piece into the top up here and it goes all the way down until it hits another piece. Okay. So if I were to, if I had a board, let me just place some stones like this. If I were to drop a piece at the top, it would come all the way down to the bottom like this. If I were to drop a piece into the top in the third column here, it would go down and then hit this piece, okay? So it's sort of a, you stack pieces on top of each other and you choose on your turn, you, your action choice is to take your color disc and drop it down that column. That's what happens. And it's called connect four because the winner of the game is the person who connects four pieces of their color in a row first. So here, for example, player two, who is placing red stones, has placed four pieces in a row, right? Those pieces can be horizontal, vertical, or diagonal, as long as you have four in a row. So let me show you an example of horizontal. So this is a win for player one, okay? And I'll just hit, I'm hitting reload to do this. Uh, here we go. So I'm just showing you a, this is a diagonal win for player one, all right? So the whole strategy of the game is making decisions on where to place your discs so that you're trying not only to get your pieces to go four in a row, but you're also trying to block your opponent from getting four in a row. So in the most basic example, let's say I'm yellow, my opponent is red, right? We just start placing stones like this, yellow, red. Okay. What should red do right now? Well, red, if it just tries to go for its own connect four, if it places it here, then yellow is just going to be able to place it here, right? On the next turn and just win. So what red should do here is place their stone on top to block yellow from being able to, to win. So what I have done is the following. I have created, oh, oh, should I explain that now? No, let me explain the user interface a bit more before I get into that. I have created a user interface in which you can select from a number of different players, okay? So if you have human selected, then the, 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 the GUI is active and you can place stuff in the GUI. If you have a, an AI player, selected. Right now it's using my solution code. If you have an AI player selected, then you can set the parameters of that AI player. So you can set the time limit, and this is in milliseconds, so a thousand would be one second. If there is a time limit selected, uh, oh sorry, you can also set the maximum depth. So the maximum depth, for example, one, would look at only the next moves that I can do. So it'll only look at the next moves and not consider any of the moves from the opponent. And what happens here is that if you have, for example, both a time limit and a maximum depth selected, then the search will end at whichever comes first. So for example, if you have max depth of one selected, it is probably the case that your max depth will be hit before the max time limit. If I set a time limit of zero, then it will say that this means there is infinite time. There is no time limit. So if there's a time limit of zero and a max depth of three, that means it will search three moves into the future. If, however, there is a max depth of zero and a time limit of say 5,000, then there is, that means that there is no depth limit, but the time will stop it at 5,000. So if both are set, it's whichever comes first, if either of them are zero, it means there is no limit. And if the, if both of them are zero, it means it will try and search the entire game tree to the end of the tree. 
And if you try and do this from the beginning of the game, there won't be nearly enough time, so you'll just hang. But if it's near the end of the game, then it might be able to search to the end of the game. So for example, if I reset this, if I set player one to yellow and player two to uh, my solution code with a one second time limit, then if I click, okay, I'm playing as a human, there we go. I moved as the human. Now, nothing has happened because the other AI player hasn't gone yet. The way I tell the AI player to take a move is I can either say, hey, AI, do a single turn, and it will think for its time limit and then do one turn. So if I make another move, it won't do anything. If I turn on autoplay, then what happens is whenever it's an AI player's turn to move, it will move, right? So you just saw that it moved. Now I'm going to place a stone and you'll see that the AI automatically takes its turn. I'm gonna stop it from winning. Now the AI takes its turn. So that's what autoplay is. And I'm gonna turn it off for a second and reset. I have two other players here. One is a random player. So the random player will literally just take a random action. So an action in here is just choosing one of the columns at random to place your piece in. So if I click do single turn, you'll see that this AI is just taking random actions, okay? It's just taking random turns. If I turn on autoplay, now random player is a very quick player, so don't blink. There we go. The game is over eventually when, when the random players have, have fought. Sometimes the random players will win or lose. Sometimes they'll, they'll draw. And a draw can happen if the whole board is filled with no connect four. So if I restart the game, they'll start playing again, right? There you go. This other player that I've included called Greedy, all Greedy does is it, it does that depth one Greedy thing. So it will say, can I win right now? If I can, I'll take the win, otherwise I won't. So if I have, uh, let's reset and I'll turn it on to uh, Greedy and I'll play against Greedy. So let's say Greedy is here. Uh, oh, turn on autoplay. So Greedy just places on the left side of the board unless it sees that it can win, right? So let me just do this. Um, I'm gonna try and set up a win for Greedy. So just give me a second here. Uh, I'm gonna place over here, then here, then here. Okay, so there. So you saw Greedy just place left, 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 left until it saw a win and then it took the win, okay? So if you see Greedy play against Random and then restart the game, it's probably the case that Greedy is gonna win against Random, right? Because Greedy just places them on a stack until it sees that it can win and then it'll win. So very rarely does Random play against Greedy. And these Random and Greedy players are just there for you to be able to test your AI against, okay? The next thing in the UI is the board slider. So it's not just, not just a four by seven board. This is like, it's an actual board where like you can make it as big as you want. It turns out that the game starts having some crazy properties when you, when you make the, the board as big as you want, but it's there if you want to test it. So just make sure that, so after you submit your AI, we are going to have an in-class competition for Connect Four. And it's not going to affect your grades if you don't do well. It's not going to affect your grades if you don't do well. But I will devote an entire lecture at some point. Do I have a, a lecture here? So maybe like the Remembrance Day lecture. I'm going to take that lecture and I will live stream the entire competition for um, for, for Connect Four. And so I'll, I'll do a bonus live stream. You can tune in. We did it last year. It was super fun. I had a lot of fun. I was like given commentary and stuff. So it's, it's interesting. But just realize that in the competition, I'm going to be resizing this board. So your players should be able to play on any size of board. Alrighty. Oops, didn't mean to open that. Okay. So the other thing here is that, so if I do a bunch of actions, Sometimes it's nice to be able to undo an action. So there's an undo action button here where I can undo something that was just done. And I have also included some debugging things for you. Now, 
alpha beta is probably going to be the hardest algorithm that you've ever had to debug. So if you implement it perfectly from the get go, congratulations. If you don't, it might be a bit of a headache to debug. It's a little bit annoying. So what I've done is I've included some test cases here. These test cases are as follows. They are different setups for different depths of look ahead for alpha beta. Here's the first one, depth one. Depth one is called win. The reason is that in this scenario, and, and by selecting depth one, it sets all of these parameters for you. So it sets the time limit, it sets the maximum depth, it sets the alpha beta. So it is yellow's turn to move. So it says with a search depth of greater than or equal to one, but also with exactly one, yellow should win the game immediately by placing a piece on top of the yellow stack at column one. So this is not column two, this is column zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, that's how they're labeled. So if I say do single AI turn, my solution AI will correctly place the stone on top of that column and win the game. If your AI does not do that, then it is incorrect. This is how we will be marking your AI, okay? So these have to be correct. Here's the test for depth two. So with a search depth greater than two, yellow should block red from winning the game on the next turn by placing its piece on column five. A depth one search will not necessarily place the piece there since depth one only checks for immediate wins. Depth two checks opponent replies to your own moves. So what this means is, let's say for example, I was the human player here. If I place the piece here, then on the next turn, red is gonna place it here and win the game. So your AI should be able to see that. So me placing my piece, that's depth one, the opponent placing the piece, that's depth two. So your AI should be able to say, for every move that you can do, check what the opponent will do. And if it does check every move that I can do, it should be able to find out that every single move except this move will be a loss for me. Because on the next turn, my opponent could have put that red one down there and won the game. So for depth two, if I do, so I've got depth two selected here. If I say do single AI turn, your AI, once it's complete, should place the yellow stone right there. Let's go even more complicated. Depth three. So with a search depth greater or equal to three, yellow should recognize that in three moves, it should win the game no matter what red does. As long as it places a piece to continue its current line along the bottom row. No matter where red will place its piece, it cannot win. Yellow should place its piece in column two or five. A shallower search will not be able to draw this conclusion. So what does that mean? So it means that the player to currently move, if it moves here or here, it is guaranteed to win three moves from now. Just watch. If I place it here, now it's red's turn. Red says, oh crap. If I place it here, well then yellow can go over here. If I place it here, yellow can go over here. So if I undo that action, right, then if I hit do single AI turn, then in order to get full marks, your AI should either place it here or here to follow this logic. And it did, okay? Let's go one more level to depth four. Depth four. So yellow should recognize that in four moves, it will lose the game if it does not immediately place a piece to either side of red's pieces on the bottom row. If both ends are left open, red can place a piece in column two and then win the game on its next move. A shallower search than four may not be able to draw this conclusion. What does this mean? Well, let's look at it. So it's currently yellow's turn to move. If yellow does not place a piece either here or here, then on the next turn, red will be able to do the opposite, okay? 
So let's say I place my piece here, then red can do the same thing that we talked about last time. It can place it here or here. If it places here, then it's gonna be able to win here or here. So that is something that you require a depth four to look at. So to get full marks, to do a single AI turn for depth four search, yours should block it either here or here. And so that's what the solution does. There you go. Okay, uh, the only other thing remaining to talk about in the user interface, oh, actually, let me see if I can show, oh, I'll, I'll do that later. All right, so over here, the only thing left to talk about is that if I hit the print eval button, um, it will call your evaluation function and it will print it over here in the side. So if I set both of these, to student alpha beta and then hit print eval, um, the evaluation function that you write will be printed over here. So you can use that to debug your evaluation function. That's what this, that's what this um, button does. Okay, so that's what the assignment is. Let's jump into the code like we always do. So here is the code. Uh, again, we have uh, like two user interface and an HTML. You're not going to be looking at those user interface things or or the html thing you don't need to worry about any of that that's already done for you that's the user interface stuff the first thing you should look at is this game state class so the game state class has um it stores essentially a 2d array of values to store this board okay so the way that this is done is it's a two-dimensional array and it stores whether or not, it stores one of three possible values. It's either gonna store, if it's blank, it's going to store no piece. If it's player one's piece or yellow, it's going to store player one, right? So maybe a one. If it's player two's piece, it's going to store a two, something like that, right? And, and that's it. So that's how the board is represented. It's, it's a board, it's a 2D array of integers. If we look over here, we can see that I have some values in here. And these are the integers that I'm gonna be storing. So player one is going to be represented by a zero in that uh, board. Player two is gonna be represented by a one. So if we alternate moves, it's zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. Um, if there's nothing in that space, then it's going to be a two. So that's just, just how I'm choosing to represent it. You could choose different numbers. And there's one more integer here, which isn't stored in the board, but the way that you are going to be able to tell if there's a winner is I have included a function, which is get winner. Okay. If player one is the winner, it returns player one. If player two is the winner, it, it returns player two. If there is no winner yet, so the game is still ongoing and there is, has been no winner yet, it's player none because no player is winning. And the only remaining scenario is if there is a draw. So if there's a draw and a draw can happen, if the entire board is filled up and there is no winner, then it will return player draw. Okay, so that's what that additional player is that sort of didn't make sense at first. So the game state, you kind of need to know how the game state works. Um, it's going to be constructed with a width and a height. That's pretty standard. So I've, I'm storing the width and the height inside the, the board itself. It's got um, this dot pieces is an array, which is of length width and stores the number of pieces in every column, okay? So if I just let, uh, let's let two randoms play out for a second, okay? So the this dot pieces is a counter of the number of pieces in every column, which may or may not be useful to you, but I've included it there. So for example, if you called this.pieces zero, that would be three because there are three pieces in the zero or first column. Here it would be four, here it would be one, zero, one, one, and two. So that is what this.pieces stores. It's an array of length, width of the board that stores the number of pieces in each column. I've also got, um, uh, an integer which stores the total number of pieces on the board. That's pretty obvious, but here it would be three, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So this dot total pieces would be 12. Um, 
This dot board, that is the array. I've set it up with some fancy JavaScript skin syntax here. This dot player, that is an integer representing whose turn it is to move right now. So at the beginning of the game, it is player one's turn to move or yellow. So that means it is this dot player would be zero because zero is player one. If it was red's turn to move, that's player two. And so this dot player would be equal to one. Okay, so whenever a player takes a move, it alternates between zero, one, zero, one. Um, this ders thing, that's just a helper function that I have written, which I'll explain in a second. This dot connect says, how many pieces in a row do you need in order to win? And this win info is another structure that I'm using that you don't need to worry about, which I'll explain in a second. So in order for you to get access to the board pieces, so over here in player student, just like you were given a, a, a grid before, you are going to have um, a board that is accessible to you, okay? And that is the state. So this game state is going to pa be passed into your functions. And oops, this get hash shouldn't be here. I'll, I'll, I'll fix that. Um, so you're going to have your alpha beta function or your evaluation function is going to take in a state. And the state is this game state object. So if you want to be able to query, hey, is there a piece or what type of piece is on like row five, column three, you can use state.get and that will just return whatever piece is on the board at that, okay? And that will be the integer associated with this. Is valid. Is valid is a nice little function. If you have an X and Y location, you are returning true for is valid. And this is done for you. The whole board is done for you. Do not worry about the board. I'm just explaining how it works. Like if I passed in is valid two two, it would be this place right here. That is a valid place on the board. If I had X equal to 10, it would not be a valid place on the board because it is off of the side of the board. So this is kind of like the is out of bounds function. It's just saying, is this X, Y location a valid piece on the board? That's it. This is a do action function. Do action takes in an action and the action is an integer representing the column to place the piece in. So in this assignment, your AI is trying to decide on an action to do, right? In assignment one, an action was an X, Y movement in the grid. In this assignment, an action is just a choice of an integer between zero and width minus one. And that integer is which column do you want to place the stone in? So it's very, very easy to like, to be intuitive about that or to, to visualize what that is. Your entire algorithm is just turning returning a number between zero and six for a board of, of width seven. So in order to do an action, what has to happen? Well, if I was to do action two here, what do I need to do? Well, I need to place the thing on the board in the correct location. I need to increase the counter of pieces on that column, and I need to increase the total number of pieces on the board. That's basically all it does. So it says it puts it into the, pla the, the correct place on the board. It counts the number of pieces, increases it by one. It changes the player to move from zero to one. And it also increases the total players on the board, okay? And undo action does the opposite of that. It just says, what was the, what was the last action that I did? Well, if I tell you that the last action I did was action two, then it takes that piece off of the board and does the exact opposite of what I just did, which is remove a piece from the column, remove total places or total pieces, and also switch the player. So do action and undo action implement the actual game mechanics for you. Uh, is legal action checks to see if an action is legal. And the way that you do that is very simple. The only way that an action is not legal is if it's outside of the, uh, the dimensions of the board or if the column is already full. So here, the legal actions would be zero, one, two is not legal. So zero, one, three, four, five, six. So two is not legal, zero, one, three, four, five, six. 
Those are the legal actions for this state. This function just does that for you. I won't even read the logic. Get legal actions just iterates over each possible action and returns an array of all the legal actions. So it, it looks over all the actions, checks to see if they're legal and returns you the legal actions, okay? So all that stuff is done for you and you can just call these functions. So all you need to worry about on this assignment is your algorithm. The connect for stuff has already been done for you. This um, function here is winner. What you can do is if you want to know if the game is over, you can call state.winner. And state.winner, I'm not gonna go through all the logic, but essentially what it does is for each place on the board, it iterates over every location and checks all the horizontals, all the verticals, and all the diagonals for four pieces of the same color in a row. And you can see the loop here, I won't get into it, you can look at it if you want, but it'll return player one if player one has already won the game, player two if player two has won the game, it'll return player none if the game is not over, and it'll return player draw if the game is a draw, meaning the entire board is full with no uh, winners. Down here, I have implemented a function called copy, which will return for you a copy of the game state. This is very similar to uh, the clone function in Java, but essentially because alpha beta expects, the only way alpha beta works properly is if you pass things by value, right? So in order to pass things by value, you need to be able to copy a state. And if you just set a new variable in JavaScript, it won't deep copy the state. It will just have a reference to that state. So what you're going to do is you're going to use this copy function. And I'll show you how you do that in a minute. Before we get into the actual um, student code, which I'm gonna get into at the very last of it, I'm gonna show you this players function. And uh, sorry, the players.js. Players.js has sample functions for you that you can look at in order to do things like, hey, how do I iterate over all of the actions? Well, this function is here to allow you to look at that. So every player class has to have two things, a constructor and a get action function. So if we look at the random player, remember the random player out here, all it does is select from a random legal action. So this player is very, very easy. All it does is select a random legal action. So how would we select a random legal action? Well, look at this. Let, let me actually make this um, a little bit bigger for you. The way we would select from a random legal action given a state is we can say let actions equal state dot get legal actions. And then all I have to do is return a random element from that array. And you can do that however you want. How I've chosen to do it is just say, get me a random number between zero and actions.length, floor that and return it. That's it. So we've gotten all of the legal actions and we return a random one. That is the entirety of the get random player. Very, very simple. The greedy player is a little bit more complicated, but it will have things that you are going to want for your assignment, okay? I'll get back to this eval function in a second. But what it's going to do is it gets passed in the state, just like yours will be passed in the state. First thing it's going to do is get those legal actions, right? So it's gonna say, okay, what are the legal actions? Now I'm going to say, um, I'm gonna set up a variable, which is the current player who is to move, right? So who is the player that is moving? Record that. I'm going to try and record a maximum action. So it's greedy. It's just gonna look at the result of all of the actions of me doing something and then return the best one. So uh, it's going to record the maximum and it's going to record the maximum action. Then it's going to say, okay, now it has to implement each action that it can do at that state. So how is it gonna do that? Well, I'm just going to iterate over the legal actions array. So for a equals zero, a is less than actions.length a plus plus, that's going to be my index into my legal actions array. I'm going to copy 
the state. This is very important. Okay, so I copy that state. Then I do the action for that child state, right? So over here, I've chosen, okay, I want to do action three. So I make a copy of the original state. So I don't modify the original state. Then I do the action in the copy of the state. Then I apply the evaluation function and record the value. So I say value equals this dot eval. And this dot eval is what's gonna give me that value. And I'll get to that function in a second. If that value is greater than my current maximum value, record the value and record the action that performed the value and then return the maximum action. Okay, so the only thing we haven't talked about is this dot eval, which is looking at the board and coming up with a value. Here's how it does that. So it gets passed in a state and it gets passed in a player. The player here, is going to be the player whose point of view we want the evaluation to be from. Because, for example, if I'm winning, I want a high value. If the opponent is winning, I want a low value. So that's exactly what this does. And it's very, very, it's the most basic possible evaluator. It says, get me the winner. So look at the board, get me the winner. If the, way, if the winner is the current player, return 10,000. That's a big number. It could just, it could be one, it could be a million, but some kind of big number. So if I'm winning, that's really, really good. Otherwise, if it's a draw or if there's no winner yet, just return zero. But if that, if none of those are true, then the other player must be winning. So if the other player is winning, return negative 10,000. So all that's saying is that if I'm winning, return 10,000. If the, or sorry, if I have one, not winning, there's no such thing as winning. If I have one, give me 10,000. If the other player won, give me negative 10,000. Otherwise, give me zero. Okay, that's what it's doing. So it's just very greedy. If it sees that it's going to like win from any of these moves, it'll just do that move that'll make it win. And there you go. So there's some sample code here. When you go to generate your child states in your, um, in your alpha beta algorithm, right? Because over here in alpha beta, you've got for every child, right? So instead of saying this, what you're gonna do is you're gonna scroll down here. You've got for C in children, right? And what you're gonna do is something like this. This is like, you can take these three lines of code copy and paste them over to your alpha beta because that's exactly what you're going to be doing for that. So these are here just to show you how you get passed in a state and how you work with that state. So that being said, let's finally go look over at the player student class. And just like all of your other um, assignments, this is the only thing that you're going to be working with, right? You're going to be filling out player student. So over in the slides, I have given you all of the parameters that are going to be class variables in the player student. So again, we've got a configuration. So the configuration is going to consist of the time limit and the maximum depth. All right, so that is what the configuration is. And if we go back uh, to the slides, we can see it's the time limit and the maximum depth. So we get passed in a config and we set that. And now we say search start time equals zero. So I've got a configuration or a variable here that records a time. And I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit, how to record time. The next variables are the best action. That's the best action we found from the search. The current best action, that's the best action so far from this depth of alpha beta search. The current max depth, that is this variable here from inside the iterative deepening alpha beta and this dot max player that is right here that is the player who is currently trying to move at this state so those are the class variables i've put out some console.log stuff for your own benefit if you want to do that so student to do you may need extra variables here in order to implement iterative deepening alpha beta properly 
So for example, you'll need to store the maximum depth of the current iteration, the best. Actually, you know what? I've already included them for you. So don't worry about that. Um, this is a relic from a previous offering of the course where we did Zobrist hashing. It was too much for the students. So we're not gonna do that. So ignore that function. Here is the function that is called by the user interface to actually get your action, okay? And so all it's doing is it's just calling iterative deepening alpha beta. That's it. So the get action function just calls your iterative deepening alpha beta function. Um, I'll get back to the eval function at the very end. In fact, oh geez, excuse me. I'm gonna put it at the very end. There we go. So here is the iterative deepening alpha beta function. What you are doing for this function is something like this. Copy paste over here, then turn that into JavaScript, okay? Literally do that, it's fine. I want it to look like that. What I don't want it to look like is, is Wikipedia, okay? I'm giving you permission to do this and then modify it so that it looks, it, it is actually working in JavaScript. Don't go to Wikipedia. Someone on assignment one, hand it in some other website's code. I'm giving it to you. I'm giving you the code, people. All right. So the iterative deepening alpha beta function, what does this do? So you have to implement this function. This function should implement iterative deepening alpha beta. It should call the separate alpha beta function, which implements the minimax search with alpha, alpha beta pruning. This function should use this.config.configuration options for the following. Config.timeLimit, that's the number of, that's the time limit in milliseconds. And a time limit of zero means that there is no time limit. So you're gonna have to put a little if statement there that says, if it's zero, don't cut me off. The max depth is the maximum depth for iterative deepening alpha beta. And we're checking to see if the current depth is greater than the maximum depth. Um, and the maximum depth of zero means there's no max. So you got a little bit of an if statement there as well. You can assume that one of time limit or max depth will always be greater than zero, okay? So I'm never going to expect you to like search the entire tree. That's what that's saying. One of them will always be zero. Please note that both of these limits should be used and whichever happens first should do the stopping condition. So the arguments, oh, be sure to return the best action from the last completed alpha beta search. We already talked about that. So the arguments are the state, that's the state for which to do the best action. And the action is what you're returning. That is the action for the player to move. And remember the action is the column starting at zero where you want to place the stone. So that's it, that, that's what you have to do. And the other thing that you need to know that in order to record the time in milliseconds for JavaScript, you can just say performance.now. So performance.now will be the current time in milliseconds, I believe. If it's not, just go look it up. Um, and you can say, okay, when I start my iterative deepening alpha beta, this dot search start time equals performance.now. And that records, for example, 5 p.m. and two seconds and 30 milliseconds. And then you have to put your code in here. That's iterative deepening alpha beta. It's probably the easiest part of the assignment. The next part you have to do is the actual alpha beta function, okay? Now, inside alpha beta, if you want to know how much time has elapsed, you say time.elap, or you can have this, oops, this is supposed to be let. Elapsed time is equal to performance.now, so I'm calling performance.now again, and subtracting when I started the search. And that will give me the amount of time that has happened since I started the search, the, the amount of time that has passed since I started the search. And you can throw an error if that time has passed. So what does this say? The alpha beta function. This function should implement minimax with alpha beta pruning. It is recommended to first get vanilla minimax search working properly before implementing the alpha beta pruning enhancement. Please be aware that this function does not return an action. It returns a state value. Actions must be set to a self variable rather than return. I'll say that class member variable rather than return. 
it is important that you copy states before generating children. Otherwise, you will be modifying references to the original state on different levels of the recursion. There is a fun optimization that you can do that doesn't require copying. I'm leaving that for you to figure it out. So, optimization alert. Once you get everything working and you want your code to run faster, you will probably see that your code is running a bit slow. The reason for that is that copying the entire board state every time is relatively slow, right? Every time I go down a depth, I have to copy the entire board state. There's an optimization that you can do that allows you to not copy states. However, I want you to, to try and figure that out on your own. All of the code that you need in order to do that implementation has already been, it's already here for you somewhere hidden in this assignment. However, only do that after you've gotten full marks. Okay, then try and, try and work on this. So the arguments, of course, as we talked about, uh, the current state, the values of alpha, beta, the current depth, and whether or not we are maximizing. Those are the values that we showed in the slides. We don't need to talk about those again. And it returns uh, a value of the state. Could be, I say int, but it's just a, it's a number. Um, so I just reiterated for you here, be sure to copy the state before doing an action and recursing. And one of the first things that you can do here is go over to players.js, take this code, copy and paste it, and then put it over here, and then start modifying this so that it looks like this, okay? So that's what I recommend doing and that's why I put it there for you. Do not start by copying and pasting code from Wikipedia, copy it from what I've already given you, okay? Then I can help you better with the code. And then we return the value and these return values are here within alpha beta. Now, the last thing that you have to do is the eval function. And let me talk a bit about the eval function. So the eval function, oops, let me, um, I'm going to turn on two human players. Here's the eval function. Given that the board looks like this, a good evaluation function should compute something that, for example, if it's a higher number, I want to be in this state. If it's a lower number, I don't want to be in this state. That's actually a tricky thing to do. So let's talk about the two extremes, right? So the two extremes are this case. So for yellow, this is 10,000. Let's just say that 10,000 is our infinity. Let's just work with that, okay? So I'm going to give this a value of 10,000 because it's the best possible state for me because I won the game, right? But for red, this is the worst possible state because red has lost the game. So let's give that a value of negative 10,000. Those are EO. And also, if it's a draw, the value is just zero. You have not won, you have not lost. There is no possibility of winning or losing, so it's just a zero. So if you're in a state that's not winning or losing, how do you know how good that state is? Well, in this function, what I've done for you is I've said, okay, if the winner is the player, return 10,000, some big number. If the winner is the other player, return negative 10,000. It's really bad that we lost. It's really good that we won. If it's a draw, return zero. However, if the game is not over yet, you have to do something clever here. What is clever? I don't know. You have to come up with a function because otherwise what you're going to be doing is what essentially the greedy player is doing, right? So the greedy player, if it's not immediately winning or losing, it just places it on the left because if it's not an immediate win or loss, it's a zero. And so what does it do? It just takes the first zero, right? And that kind of sucks. <laughs> It would want, hopefully, maybe, okay, here's an evaluation function, a possible one. Um, maybe if I have more pieces near the middle, the number is higher. That's an example of an evaluation function. 
in chess, uh, an evaluation function that humans often use is to say, I'm going to give um, a value to pieces on the board. Pawns are worth one, queen's worth nine, rook is worth five, whatever. I'll sum up the value of the pieces on the board and my evaluation function is, is my value minus your value. So if I have more players, it's a higher number than if you have your more pieces, right? It's a decent guess, but it's not perfect. But that's what a heuristic is. It's a guess at how good the state is. Let's look at one evaluation function that I'm actually going to recommend that you try to do for this assignment because it's very powerful. This is a very powerful evaluation function. Um, there's a concept in the game of how many places do I still have available where I could possibly make a connect for, right? So for example, if the board is empty and I'm playing as yellow, I could make a connect for here, 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 here. Okay, you can get it. I could make one here or here or here or here. So let's take, let's make a function that counts the number of places where I could still make a connect for. The idea is that if I have more places left where I could make a connect for, then you have places left where you could make a connect for, then I'm probably winning. It's a relatively simple but powerful evaluation function. And here's why, watch this. Ideally, you want to control the middle of a connect four board. Why? Watch this. If I place a single piece right here, it has cut off this connect four for yellow, this connect four for yellow, this connect four for yellow, and this connect four for yellow, and this one, and this one, and this one, all by placing a single piece. If I had instead placed my piece over here for red, then the only places I've cut off yellow are here, here, and here, right? So which one of those moves would you prefer to do? The one that cut off like 10 places for yellow to go, or the one that cut off three places for yellow to go? So that is an idea at a heuristic function that you can do. And I will tell you that there are marks associated with that heuristic function. I'll go over the marks in a second. But in order to win the competition, you are going to have to come up with some sort of smart heuristic function. Otherwise, you'll just be placing them all the way down the left. Then, you know, it won't be very smart. So let's go back. This is where you put, oops, this is where you put that logic, okay? So this is where you say, okay, game state dot get x, y, I'm going to be checking, going to be iterating, seeing where I can make connect fours, all that kind of stuff. You can go online. I don't want you to copy and paste anyone's evaluation function, but if you go online and you find someone who talks about a really powerful connect four evaluation function, please put a comment here. I got this idea from this YouTube video and put it in there. It's fine. Don't copy and paste their code, please. Implement it yourself, but cite where you got the idea from and I will be okay with you getting ideas. If you put something there that I recognize from a website or a YouTube video, and I've seen a lot of them, if you don't cite it there, that will be plagiarism. But if you do cite it, it will be okay. The very last thing I will show you is the marking scheme for this assignment. So that, that's it. That's the assignment. It's, it's really not that much work, but it might be a lot of debugging. So start it whenever you can. We have the, the standard code style readability. 10% is on your heuristic function. Okay, 10% of your assignment is your heuristic function. So please do something intelligent. And I mean something more than just counting the pieces on the board. So try to implement what I said. I, okay, 10% of you get that and anything extra is good for you. Iterative deepening alpha beta is 30%. So if you properly set the current max depth, um, 
properly update the action of the completed searches and it passes all four tests, okay? Alpha beta code working properly. This is no longer a thing. So this iterative deepening alpha beta passes all four tests. This is also part of the alpha beta, right? You have to pass all of those tests to get full marks. And if you want to participate, um, so for example, if you don't get the time limit working properly, but you get the max depth working properly, you will still get some marks, just not all the marks. But to participate in the class competition and get the bragging rights, you must have both of these working properly. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Um, what I recommend very heavily is make heavy use of the debugging uh, uh, options within, one second here. Um, so for example, in my depth one win over here, when I click do single AI turn, you can see over on the right, I'll make this bigger, one second. Yes, okay, you can see that, great. So if I click, ah, I can't click the button, all right. So here in the button, my solution code uses that evaluation function of being 10,000 for a win or negative 10,000 for a loss. So in this case, let's think about what all of our evaluations should be. If I place a stone right here, there is no win, so it should be a zero. If I place it here, I'm winning, so it's 10,000. If I place anything over here, then it's a zero, right? And that's what I see over here. So in my alpha beta function, in my solution, what I have done is detect Am I at the root node? If I am at the root node, then print out my values of my alpha beta return. Because that will help me debug and say, okay, it didn't see a win here, it did see a win here, it didn't see a win here. My best action value was 10,000 and my best action was one. So if I then click do the turn, that's what prints out. If I then look at depth two, okay, and I do single A, well, let's look at this. If I'm searching to depth two, if I place it here, well then my opponent, if, if I place it anywhere but right here, my opponent can win. So what I should see is negative 10,000 everywhere except right here, which should be a zero because it's not the end of the game. So if I hit do single AI turn, that's exactly what I see. Whew. Is on action five, that would have been a loss if I had put it anywhere else. See this? All my other actions are negative 10,000, but action five is zero. So the best action value was zero and the best action was five. So I recommend making judicious use of similar debugging for your alpha beta because it can be a little spicy to debug.